discussion, um, which is focused on sustainable peace and social inclusion in Colombia, with an emphasis placed on lessons from the peace process and related cases of two other countries in Latin America. Um, my name's Bryony Jones. I'm a reader in international development in the politics and international studies department at the University of Warwick. I'm also the co-director of the Warwick Interdisciplinary Research Centre for International Development. And it's in my capacity as co-director that I'm here chairing the session because we've recently um, begun collaborating, formal collaborations with the Abercol Foundation um, as one of our partners of Wicked. So we're really excited about that. We focus in Wicked on uh, various different topics related to inequalities and in research in the global south, one of which is peace, conflict and justice. And I think a lot of the work that the Abercol Foundation does chimes really well with our interests and vice versa. So this is our first event together and I'm really pleased um, to be here and to be sharing it with you. So thank you very much. At this stage, I will pass over first to Susanna and then to Carolina to hear more about them and a bit about the foundation before we get into the substance of today's event. So Susanna, please. Thank you very much, Brioni, and thank you very much to all the assistants and to our new partners uh, from Warwick University. And we're very uh, happy to be <clears throat> um, collaborating on this um, webinar. It's our first one uh, for uh, the, the coming ones that we really want to, to do together. Um, I'll introduce myself. My name is Susana Lozada. I am the representative of Fundación Abacol to the United Nations. Fundación Abacol Colombia was accredited with ECOSOC status in 2019. And since then, I've been representing the NGO before the, before the UN at different events, especially on topics uh, focused on the Colombian peace process and human rights. And I'm very happy to be sharing more with all of you about the peace process happening, currently happening in our country and all the the sustainable peace that we are working on as an NGO. Thank you so much, Susanna. Carolina, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself, please? Yes, uh, good evening to everyone who is participating today at the webinar. Uh, I'm really excited to, to share this uh, time with you and just a quick introduction to myself. Uh, so I'm Carolina. And I'm currently managing the um, office we have in the Middle East. Uh, we're based in Dubai. And I've been here uh, living, uh, this is going to be my 10th month here. And uh, our office started as well 10 months ago. And I'm pretty much managing what is introduction, the foundation into the Middle East. Um, and also um, building uh, fundraisings and partnerships in, with other organizations in the Middle East and all this um, Asia continent. And um, I have a passion for humanity and I like uh, also um, helping uh, different um, people around the world and and yeah I'm, I'm 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 very excited to share this time with you <laughs> yeah wonderful thank you so much um so for those of you that may not be uh, familiar with uh, the abacol foundation's work they were originally established in 2005 to work particularly with uh, vulnerable children in colombia but have um, since then expanded their remit to work with victims of um, the conflict around uh, kind of social uh, social integration and social support, for example, marginalization inequalities. I um, mean, it's the peace process that we're going to particularly focus on 
in the discussion today. And maybe just to open uh, the conversation, um, I mean, you'd both particularly wanted to have this comparative element to the discussion to reflect on um, the cases of Peru and Honduras alongside that of Colombia and the work that you're doing in Colombia. Um, so maybe I just ask you first, Susanna, um, why talk about these three countries together and what can we learn um, from their conflicts? Um, what can we take away if we have a comparative element? Thank you. Thank you very much, Brioni. Let me share a PowerPoint that we, we have done for, I have done for the presentation. Well, um, as uh, the Colombian peace, uh, the Colombian conflict uh, is a very particular one. But today I would like to compare it to two countries in the Latin American region and Central American region. And this will be Peru and Honduras. So uh, the Peruvian conflict uh, is well known because of El Sendero Luminoso, which was a guerrilla group as well. Uh, during the Peruvian conflict, it was a lot of terror, internal terrorism that left poverty and lack of resources. Especially Lima, the capital uh, city of Peru, was affected. Honduras uh, had a similar conflict uh, in the 80s. It was a diplomatic dispute, a territory conflict between the three Central American countries, Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. Uh, this compared to Peru, uh, Honduras went into a peace process. And because it was a diplomatic dispute, a territory conflict, um, they, they came together and they signed a peace agreement, a territory peace agreement. And I'll compare these two countries to, our Colum to the Colombian uh, conflict. Uh, the Colombian conflict is well known because of internal conflict, internal terrorism, internal guerrilla, and fight between the government and the guerrilla. Uh, the three countries, they have suffered internal terrorism, territory conflict as well. Mm, but compare Colombia compared to Peru and to, to Honduras, it has been the longest war. We have lived a war for more than 50 years. In 2012, uh, the government has started uh, to uh, have a peace uh, talks with the guerrilla FARC uh, because we have two um, uh, uh, guerrillas, the ELN and the FARC, and the peace agreement was signed in 2016 between the government and the guerrilla. Since then, the country has been immersed into the, all the peace process that, uh, of course, this comes into um, a lot of changes inside, inside the con country. But uh, last week, we commemorated the, the five years of the peace agreement and the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres was in Bogota in the capital city of Colombia to commemorate these five years. Uh, compared to all the Latin American conflicts living in different countries, Colombia has been the one that have suffered so many years the war. Um, it has not been easy, of course, as a country, and the peace process, it would, it, as the war lasted more than 50 years, we believe that the peace process, it will take also so, some more time. But <clears throat> we can, what we can relate from the conflicts living <clears throat> in Peru and in Honduras is that the terrorism and the, the, the um, territory conflict, it's something that has affected the three countries deeply. Um, in, in a conflict, most of the population uh, are the ones that are affected. In the Colombian case, uh, when we talk about 
territory conflict. And when we talk about terrorism, <clears throat> we also have to talk about narcotraffic because it's something that it involves uh, the, 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 um, the, the, the conflict. And uh, that's one of the big issues in, in our country. And compared to Peru and to, to Honduras, it's something that, that needs, of course, some uh, like a deeper attention when we go into the peace process. Thank you so much, Susanna. That's really interesting. And I really appreciate a, a comparative perspective in terms of drawing out the dynamics in the region, but helping with kind of learning and understanding how uh, how conflicts arise, but also how processes to respond to conflicts can be put into place. Um, maybe Carolina, I could come to you at this stage to learn a little bit more about the signing of the peace agreement in Colombia and particularly issues around social and economic inclusion, which I know are really central to the work of the foundation. Yeah, Bruni. Uh, so uh, when we talk about the signing agreement in Colombia, uh, I have to tell a little story about this and um, personal story probably. And uh, I grew up basically in, in a war country. And so the war, as Susana mentioned, it started 50 years ago. And so my generation, which is the 90s one, we grew up in, in a war country. So we, we basically, the topic of signing and a peace agreement was pretty new for my generation and to everyone. And, and so when we, I remember when we started and when hearing the signing process uh, that was, that it started on 2012 and it was, very new for everyone. And so that was the time when the president Juan Manuel Santos was was uh, in, in the presidential term. And um, these negotiations uh, went six years, all his, um, all his more than six years when he was uh, president. And, uh, and I remember it was, um, like a, a, a very difficult time because the FARC movement, the revolutionary armed forces, they have so much power in Colombia still that uh, it was a difficult time. So um, we had to uh, vote uh, through this signing agreement. And I remember just point, I think it was zero point one votes that the that the signing agreement didn't work so it was very confusing time for the country and it's still i don't know if the peace process agreement is still going through and it's 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 it's, it's valid or is is working in colombia so so yeah so um when we talk more about the social inclusion in, 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 in the country, I will say that uh, there are some opportunities and dignity and, and to this uh, FARC uh, revolutionary armed uh, people that have been changed over the, the, the years and since the, the process was made. But I think there are still many things that are that needs attention in terms of economic inclusion because there is still inequality there is still repression there is still poverty in between communities and there is still um, fear if um, between the the left parties and and um, and for them to come in into a civil normal life so so there's still many things that have to uh, work on. And, and so um, that's why, well, with, with the uh, Avacol Foundation, with our organization, we created uh, a vision that we call it the Leadership and Training Development Center. And 
the, the idea of this uh, vision is to, to build new opportunities, especially to the young generation that it's facing this new signing peace agreement to start um, new businesses, new opportunities in, in different areas and regions that mostly we call them the red zones in Colombia because they're more the most affected affected um, zones and from the world and and it started it started their own business uh, work the land or work in different ideas uh, businesses ideas that that they can produce and they can uh, develop more so um, also a sustainable economic inclusion in Colombia needs access to decent uh, work for the Colombian populations, uh, also promotion of opportunities, more opportunities engagement between national organizations, companies and regional institutions to provide work to the affected population. So, so there is still work on, on, on the economic inclusion. And, but I think as, as, as uh, a foundation, we, we we would love to, to cover more areas and to help this, um, this inclusion to these uh, people that mostly are, have been all their life engaged in this war. So, so yeah, uh, that's... Thank you so much. I think that's, for me, it's really interesting listening to you describing there some of the the kind of the challenges and the, in a sense, the solutions that Colombia really requires in order to move forward into a period of sustainable peace. You know, you really see where kind of peace work and justice work and development work might come together and intersect and potentially reinforce each other. Um, thinking of the peace process beyond a specific political kind of elite led process and something which is really um, grounded in the broader population and community. Um, and that maybe brings me on to a question that uh, that to pose for to Susanna um, about really kind of it would be great to know a bit more about the realities for people living in Colombia today, um, particularly given the context of such a long-standing uh, armed violence. Um, the questions around trust, social cohesion, forgiveness, and um, where do you how do you understand the situation at the moment in Colombia? Yes, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, the importance of forgiveness in, a pe in every peace process is key. Uh, reincorporation to society is something that uh, during the peace process we've been working on. Since uh, the peace agreement was signed, um, the government has focused a lot on, uh, on, on on reincorporation to society, uh, mostly to the victims of the armed conflict. Uh, it, was um, it was created the um, uh, justice process and most of the countries that have suffered a war, especially African countries, uh, when we talk about South Africa, what they have experienced as well, I think every peace process is different. Um, every country has suffered in, suffer in a different way. So the peace process takes quite a long time. Reincorporation to society, as I was mentioning, is very important. Why? Because most of these guerrilla armed groups have been uh, living um, outside the society for many, many years. They have been into the mountains, living there. And they, uh, during this peace agreement, the idea and what uh, the gov government also wants is a reincorporation for them. Of course, uh, this uh, is something that is still very unstable in, in the country, is something that uh, quite quite difficult to work on, um, but mostly uh, it is working on with the victims, with the victims uh, that have have suffered. The Colombian conflict is a very particular one because uh, we do have children involved. 
uh, we one of the largest uh, percentage of of our conflict um, uh, of is children who have been recruited by the FARC and the guerrilla. This is uh, as an NGO is something that we do have to work, uh, of course, very careful. But at the same time, it makes our work uh, more value. Why? Because we are working directly with this population. During the forgiveness and peace process, uh, we are also focusing on dialogue, um, talking about what uh, the victims talking about what they have suffered is so important because in that way the the process the justice process will be easier trust as well is not uh is is not easy uh, but uh, the more that we are working with the population the the closer we can get and we can help them as well um when we go into the zones that have been affected by the war is when we see the reality of the country. We really, uh, in the capital cities, or I will talk about Bogota, uh, it's a different reality. The reality, we see it when we go into uh, the deep zones of Colombia with, where the guerrilla is still based and where the reincorporation centers that have been built during this peace process um, are, are focused on. That's where we see the reality of the country. And that's where our work is focusing on because, uh, uh, and, and that's part of, of all this process and our work as well. Um, when we go into the camps that the government especially have built is something that uh, really touches our heart. Really, uh, we come into reality and we see that that's where the victims are. That's why the direct contact with uh, the affected population and talking about with, talking with them uh, hearing about their stories, what they have faced, it, it's something that makes our work um, closer to the peace process and the forgiveness process that we all as Colombians are living. More, I would say here, that more than 50% of the Colombian families in somehow have been affected by the war in the country. And that makes our work uh, as an NGO, of course, makes it harder. But at the same time, we believe that uh, we, we are doing something that not even other organizations uh, are doing it, or not even sometimes not even the government. But that's why we, uh, and I will take a little bit of what Carolina was mentioning, uh, our vision of this uh, leadership and training development center is so important because we believe that with this center, we really uh, will start um, to cooperate together with the country and with all the things that are going on inside the country to help our population. And I will take, talk later about this in a deeper way. But I will just mention these four points, reincorporation to society, dialogue, trust, and truth. Those are very important during the forgiveness and peace process that we are going through um, as a country. Sorry, I thought I was unmuted. Thank you so much, Susanna. Um, Carolina, then maybe um, we've heard there about some of the specifics of the Colombian experience and context and the particular challenges facing the Colombian population um, as, as you seek to, to implement a peace process, to move through processes of forgiveness and, and trust building and reincorporation. It'd be good to maybe know a bit more from you about 
how we can actually learn from the Colombian peace process. Um, how can other countries who faced internal conflicts be helped by looking at what's been done in Colombia and the process unfolding there? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, uh, as I was mentioned, uh, Colombia, it's a very particular case in terms of on, yeah, on the peace process. Um, it hasn't been a perfect one, as we saw the examples of Peru and Honduras and other countries. Um, yeah, it's it's not a perfect one, but well, the uh, our organization, Navacol Foundation, it's we're doing our best, and through this process and the affected population. So, I think that. Um, one of the examples that maybe can be taken uh, through other countries that probably need this as, uh, as an example, it will be the, I would say the transitory local zones that we call them um, zonas veredales in Spanish. And they are around 23 of them in, in Colombia and um, for me, personal um, comment that will be a, a good example because in these transitory local zones, um, so the you can openly work in uh, with the humanitarian cases, and I I also uh, think the uh, there's still some of them going on. And as an organization, as our, our as a nonprofit organization, we're allowed to go to these areas and to to help uh, the community there uh, if they may need psychological help or if they may need any humanitarian help. So I think this uh, transitory local zones that they have assigned um, for these communities, affected communities, I think it's a very good example. And, uh, and also in this um, transitory local zones, you can work with the communities in terms of forgiveness and, and, and talks to the communities and because it's, it's, it's a process that they have to go through. And also uh, I will say that um, it's important not to go through the same mistakes and and despite there there's still many communities affected and is still living in in conflict uh, our work as a non-profit is building trust and hope so conflict can can stop but i will say that this uh, transitory local zones has been a very good example and we have we we had the opportunity to go through the this uh, transitory local source to two of them in in Colombia, and um, it's it's not an easy um, way and, and process to do it, but I think it's it's a good chance to to be with the people who have been affected to help them and to to work with them in hand so they can reincorporate into civil life. I don't know how the future will be with this new government. So next year will be new elections and with new elections comes new rules and new, um, new reorganization on this process. But um, I will definitely think that the transitory local zones are a very good way to help the communities who have been affected. And, and yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's really good to get sense. I think of the national picture and agenda at the moment as well, in terms of the um, different aspects that other countries could maybe learn from the Colombian case. Maybe it would be helpful um, having heard that to hear from you, Susanna, specifically about the work of the foundation and how you're working with affected populations in order to complement um, the work that's happening kind of nationally, but also to ensure that the momentum continues, even if there are political changes and changes in government. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, well, currently, Fundación Colombia 
is uh, working very hard at the moment, especially uh, during this peace process agreement, but also uh, with a lot of things going on inside the country. As it was mentioned next year, we're gonna have the presidential elections, something that currently uh, is uh, coming a lot of political movements are, are starting to, to come together to, to, to of course make uh, uh, their political um, campaigns and everything. Uh, we have been into this COVID-19 uh, pandemic, which has affected a lot. So uh, the, we've been through uh, this peace process, we're going through then the pandemic and then uh, presidential elections next year. So there's a lot of things going on inside Colombia, uh, a lot of uh, things, uh, very unstable things. But as an NGO, Fundación Agua Colombia is committing uh, to work with the population. And that's why we have created the Leadership and Training Development Center. At the moment, we have a team of 10 volunteers who are um, working in hand with uh, our organization. And we are, we are training them to work and to be leaders in, in this change, to, to, to make a difference to these changes that are happening in, inside the country. Um, most of these young people and most of the volunteers that we are having uh, in somehow have been affected by the war, but something uh, that really touches our heart and our organization is that they are really looking for new opportunities in their lives, despite the, the problems that they have faced, despite um, the, the problematics uh, that they have lived uh, because of the war they really want to train themselves and they really want to study. They really want to, to, to help the country as well with, with, their, with their leadership that they, these young people have. And our idea, and at the moment, they are training themselves um, on, on a course that we are offering, focus on humanitarian leadership so they can help these communities that have been affected by the war. Um, we're very happy because we uh, recently, we, we, are, we received uh, uh, a notification to be the first Colombian NGO uh, to use digital badges to train and to, to accredit our learners, our, our volunteers on educational training, digital training. And having this accreditation has helped us a lot because uh, we are doing it everything online at the moment. And uh, they're very happy, uh, very, the graduation will be this coming December. And they're very happy to train themselves uh, on such topics on humanitarian leadership. And we're even more happy to be the first Colombian NGO to, to use this digital accreditation to, to, to accredit our learners. Um, also, uh, we are building a, a national and international team to work on topics such as peace, uh, humanitarian leadership, and teamwork, other topics, so they can also work in the field and they can help the population. Most of our work is also focused on the Sustainable Development Goals Agenda 2030 of United Nations, uh, specifically uh, SDG number 16, which is peace, justice, and strong institutions. We believe that the 2030 agenda has been one of our main focus uh, to continue our work. Um, we really want to include the young generation, specifically uh, the, the population affected by the war so they can be a change in the country, but they can also 
uh, be trained as leaders and they can change the reality of the country. Uh, something that uh, is very, very nice about Colombians is that we are known because we are the happiest country in the world and the kindest as well, despite the war, the, despite the reality that we face in the country, we, you can see that in every Colombian and a smile. Why? Because we don't focus on the reality of the country. And that's something when we work with our volunteers, especially with the, these young people, we really want to, uh, we really want for them to, to take like their personal experience, like their testimony or their, what they have uh, been through to share it with other people because in that way, they're also being part of this peace process, talking uh, with their personal experience, talking with through, it, it, it gives us as well um, another face of, of the country. And that's basically what Fundación Ava Colombia wants. We really want to work with, especially with the young generation to build a new country but most important to train them so they can be leaders of change uh, to, to other, uh, to, uh, and, 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 uh, and be an example to other countries that are, are still, that are currently going into a peace process. Um, that's basically what Fundación Agua Colombia is working on and, and what we are doing. Thank you so much. Um, I've really appreciated learning more about the details of your work, but also connecting what you're doing to the broader kind of challenges in the country, but also the opportunities and the peace process itself. So um, I've really enjoyed that. And I'm sure everyone listening to the webinar has as well. At this stage, it would probably make sense to open up for questions and comments, reflections from the audience. If you'd like to do so, you could either put your question in the chat marking it anonymous if you don't want it to appear on the recording um, or you could just raise your hand in the raise hand function so please the floor is open now while we're sorry Susanna yeah yeah Bruni we would like to uh before well uh, as the 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 audience uh, is they're they're attentive we would like to share a video clip um before we end the the webinar and before we we also have the q a session but we would like to share a video clip uh to show you more about our work current work in colombia that would be wonderful. Thank you so much. I'll let you share the screen. Thank you. Great. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Yes. Great.
Thank you, Susanna. Is there anything in addition you wanted to say about the video? Were you happen to happy to open to questions or comments? Yeah, we can go ahead for comments and questions. Great, thanks so much. Um, maybe while people are kind of gathering their thoughts, because I know it's often hard to digest when you hear a lot of information and you're thinking about how to respond to it. Um, and maybe just start with like a really, um, sorry if it's a very like, simple question, but do you, but you're working obviously a lot with children and young people. What do you understand as being their vision or their kind of expectations for peace in Colombia? And do you see similarities amongst young people and children, or do you see a lot of differences about what peace would mean to them and what they think it should look like in the Colombian context? That could be for either of you. Okay, so um, I, I can share my, my, my opinion and then I'll let Carolina share, it, share hers. I think that for young people, especially our generation, uh, we have lived uh, we have lived the conflict in somehow children between eight, ten, I'll say twelve years. They have they have experienced more the the, the peace process of the country. As a young generation, and I personally talk about me, I have lived the war and. Of course, the peace agreement and the signing as well. But my pers the perspective of young of young people is so different that from the perspective of the of the children. Why? Because uh, in somehow the young generation has been affected by the war. And I'll tell I'll just share uh, um, a small um, uh, anecdote I have. Uh, when I was around 12 years old, um, and because of the work of my dad, um, we went into a conflict zone in Colombia. Uh, it's called San Jose del Guaviare, where the guerrilla at that time uh, was at its tops. So it, it was very dangerous to be there, but we went because of my dad's work. And I remember during the night, uh, it was so uh, difficult to, I mean, I was very scared because the airplanes were, you know, coming uh, very, uh, uh, like the sound was very, very hard. And you still, uh, the noise and everything. During those, during that time, the 80s, the 90s was the hardest, uh, conflict and war in Colombia. So the perspective for the young generation is so different because we have suffered the war in somehow. For children, I think that uh, they, well, they also have been affected, but I think that is different. Even when we talk about uh, rec recruitment of children into the guerrilla, and the families that have been affected as well, in somehow they see a different perspective. But I personally talk that every family and every uh, um, children and young people, they have a different perspective, but they have also personal experiences of what the war has done into their lives as well. Thank you, Susanna. Carolina, is there anything you wanted to add to that or? Uh, yeah, well, just wanted to add, uh, yeah, I think for the young people and children, the, um, yeah, the challenge is to, to have the hope of a new future, new opportunities. Um, it takes time, yeah, uh, but um, nothing come easy when you go through a war. So, so yeah, but in terms of this, um, for example, as, uh, as an organization, the training that we're doing the, with the young people and the communities and the children and with the parents and families, I think that's a new way and new hope for them. 
So I'll just add that, that for them, it's it, it hopefully can be a, a better future. Yeah. Thank you so much. Do we have any other questions or comments from the audience? Yes, my question would be, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, my question would be, when it comes to the term uh, of justice, um, how do you, uh, in Aba Colombia, how do you work on, on the common understanding when it comes to the term justice um, in, in cooperation work? Let's say that you from Aba Colombia are working with international partners um, from the global north. How do you work on, on having a common understanding? What is just, what is fair for the local population? Um, we are from Switzerland, we are making the experience that this is a topic we often need to work on first to have a common understanding in order to, to, um, to have common goals in, in uh, justice work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon, for this question. And it's it's very important as well. Uh, I think that when we talk about justice, we as an as an NGO, we really we are really focusing on not only on what Carolina was mentioned during the presentation, because uh, we also believe that access to work and promotion of new opportunities. Uh, an engagement between national organizations and regional institutions inside Colombia is important because in that way, we're also creating new opportunities for the people. I think that justice comes very, it's a very bright and big topic to focus on, not only on social inclusion, but also economic inclusion and also opportunities. But as an NGO, we are focusing mostly on creation, on the creation of new opportunities. So uh, young people especially can have access to work. They can create, they can even create their own business. And, and they can, and, and then we can, then we can talk about sustainable peace because in that way, we're also working with national companies, with national entities, and connecting that work with the work that Fundación Ava Colombia is developing. Our idea and what we are also uh, want is to um, partner with other international entities so we can connect the work at the national but also international level. That's basically what we're focusing on at the moment. I don't know if Carolina would like to share more. Uh, yeah, well, just the last um, thing you mentioned about international collaboration, I think it's important. Um, now the world cannot be close to just one country, to just one problem. We need the help from others. We need, um, to, to be open to receive help from others, other countries, other organizations. And I think the world really needs now to collaborate through each other. And in this, through this, we can build justice, as you said, and it is a very important topic, but I think we need uh, the help of everyone to do it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susanna and Carolina. If you have any other questions or comments, you can put them in the chat or raise your hand. In the meantime, I would maybe just um, just to build on the, the question there, which I think is a really interesting one and, and also your responses. Um, I mean, I'm very interested in this question of um, commonality of understanding or diversity of opinion and what um, effect that has on a peace process or processes of reconciliation for example and building trust amongst community 
following um, large scale violations of human rights. And it's not always evident to me that a common understanding is either possible or desirable. Um, and this is maybe like, I don't want to open up a really large discussion just before we have to finish in a few minutes, but I think it's something that's uh, particularly interesting. It plays into some of the dynamics that you kind of alluded to in your, in your question um, regarding collaboration with other actors, with local actors versus you know, non-Columbian actors, for example, um, with access to funding and resources, to access to profile and media, for example, whether or not we use a similar language, and if that helps raise the profile of certain work or not. And I, I imagine both of you, Susanna and Carolina, in your different roles, both out of the country and, and at liaising with the UN, you can see that very clearly that there's, we coalesce around a particular language or a particular understanding of peace and of justice. And that of course shapes the work that we do. So I think for me, that's particularly interesting. And at the uh, our research center at the Wicked Research Center, we focus a lot on that trying to unpick um, different disciplinary approaches, but al also approaches of different countries, different cultures, different experiences to uh, the way we might understand uh, peace, justice, conflict, violence, for example. So I also really appreciated the question. Thank you. Um, we actually have to wrap up in a couple of minutes. If there are any other questions, this is your moment to ask them or comments. It doesn't have to be a question. Just to finish, I really want to highlight that the importance of international involvement during a peace process is very, is, is key, I, I would say. In our, in our country, international, as the conflict was a national conflict, internal conflict, uh, the peace process, uh, many countries have been involved during this peace process. But engagement, international engagement, I would say it's key. Why? Because in that way, uh, other people who are not involved in, in, inside the country, or, or I would say Colombians, uh, they can see another perspective and help us in, in a different way. Uh, is so different uh, when we as Colombians help other Colombians because we have facing somehow the war and we are, I mean, we are helping in our way. We, we do the best, but when we see a different, like an international perspective is so different because in that way, people uh, and international organizations they can see also the reality and help in a different way uh, the conflict and go into this conflict resolution that, that we, we as a country are facing. So I believe that international engagement at this point, when the peace agreement was recently signed, we just been into five years of the peace process, we're going into presidential elections, but still we're going on, it's very important. Uh, because in that way we'll, we will turn on like the face of, of, of the Colombian conflict and we will find out different solutions for, for the society. Thank you, Susanna. That was really um, important, I think, and serves as a nice wrap up for the session, if I will. Um, we're just very excited to now be in this partnership with you and, um, and to learn more about um, the work that you're doing and to collaborate together and so hopefully this uh, webinar this first introduction to your work is the start of some ongoing and um, collaborations between our research center and your foundation so huge huge thanks to both to Susanna and Carolina for their inputs for telling us about the work that you're doing reflecting on that uh, on the peace process in Colombia particularly in a comparative international perspective um, huge thanks also to our um, research um, support assistant Isha, who's um, helped with the setting up of the event and managing it so so wonderfully. Um, I wish you all a good evening or morning, depending where you are in the world, um, and look forward to seeing you at future Wicked events. Thank you so much. Goodbye. <laughs>